We're live. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. It's Public Safety Committee. Um, it's 9 o'clock, actually 9.01, Monday, August 10th. All committee members are present, including administration. And this is a virtual meeting due to COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> um, the uh, next item on the agenda is public comment. And uh, we'll, call, we'll go ahead and call the order. And knowledge of the press and public have been duly notified in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the next item is the uh, approval of previous month's minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Are there any changes? No changes, so move, Ryan. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. Um, next item is citizens' comments. Desiree, do you want me to go ahead and want to go and start with these, or do you want to readjust the, uh, the agenda now to move some things up? I'm not sure how long citizen comments will be. I'll read as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> up, up to you. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Nicole. Comments, and then, um, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. All right. The first one is from Sally Wiseman, 35 Fairway Dunes Lane. Uh, titled Dogs and Coyotes. This morning at 7.30 a.m. Monday, August 10th, I used my IOP PD yellow whistle to identify and alert which of the beach walkers was the quote master of the dog that was approaching me. After our neighbor was bitten last week, I'm especially diligent and practice defensive walking. A short while later, while typing this on my phone, another dog startled me at my calf. My scream alerted the master who simply said sorry. Noted the sign at access 35A says accompanied unleashed dogs allowed. Rather, it should say controlled unleashed because that's the ordinance as I recall. Please somehow enforce with a heavy deterrent having to deal physically and emotionally with the dog bite and going to small claims court as the deterrent is too much for the victim to bear alone. Please consider city imposed encroachments and deterrents regarding coyotes, ripe fallen fruit, abundantly laying beneath palm trees across from Access 35A, are coyote attractant. Please be sure the city is administering the coyote management plan adopted two years ago in May. Um, Christopher Brown, 128 Sparrow Drive, as you are well aware, there is far too much drama and vitriol on local Facebook groups surrounding the parking situation on IOP. It has become increasingly apparent over the past few months that the pandemic has driven a lot of crazy out of hiding and into the open. The incivility has now taken a turn to actually posting photos of island residents' homes and cars, featuring suggestions that people spread nails around the residents' cars or sideswipe it, and uh, is followed by a lengthy um, URL. We are rapidly reaching the point where the anger and vitriol over something as stupid as inconvenient beach parking is starting to lead to calls of vandalism on residents. We are not far from the point where someone is going to get assaulted over it. In 2019, I would have thought that statement sounded alarmist, but 2020 has seen a lot of violence across the country for all kinds of ridiculous reasons. I encourage council to address this issue and to stay the course on parking restrictions. We must not allow threats of vandalism or violence to dictate our policy. First, I encourage the council to address this issue head on and make it clear that threatening residents will not influence the need to the need to enforce social distancing during a pandemic to serve the need, interest of public safety. Secondly, I encourage the council and specifically the public safety committee to communicate this Facebook to communicate this Facebook group and the comments encouraging illegal activity. Uh, my wife Rebecca Bowen submitted screenshots of the linked image above. <clears throat> to local law enforcement for review. Apparently people have forgotten how to be civil or worse, the civility was just a veneer and the current state of unrest and other matters has given these people the license to show their true colors. Either way, we do not need or want them on our island to spread nails around cars or to enjoy our beaches. And we need to make sure that they understand that throwing a tantrum or Facebook on Facebook and threatening to commit crimes on our islands will not be rewarded. Uh, Rebecca Bowen, also 128 Sparrow, I want you to consider, I write to you as, to, as a concerned IOP resident and parent, my husband and I have resided on the island for four years and purposely chose it because it is a safe place to raise our family. We also, we are also realists and understand that free parking is a thing of the past in an area that is growing as quickly as Charleston is, it is completely unrealistic to expect to park for free at any popular spot, be it beach or downtown. As a parent though, I have grown increasingly concerned by the posts that I have seen on the Charleston area public beach access and parking group on Facebook. They have increasingly made violent threats towards residents on IOP, Sullivan's and Folly, including taking on posting people's home addresses 
And as of today, taking a picture of someone's car license plate and posting it on Facebook and encouraging members of the Facebook page to consult the county tax records to find out who this person is. This is extremely threatening and inappropriate. I know the subject of parking is on this week's agenda and I strongly encourage you to either ban continue the ban on parking or move to paid parking so we can put this mess behind us. Residents are increasingly terrified by the threats that this radical unhinged group is making and we would like to see this issue put to rest. Sandy Ferenz, uh, for Seahorse Court. This comment submitted August 8th for the August 10th public safety since comments are read in the order in which they are received. A commercial trailer that has been parked 24 seven parallel to the baseball field on 29th Avenue, walking <laughs> parking places numbered 47 and 48 and a back corner of the handicapped parking place. There are no tags or markings to identify the owner or business. My question is how and why is this trailer permitted to park on 27th? Is overnight commercial parking allowed on 27th? And if so, when, when was that ordinance passed? I cannot find it. Uh, Lawrence Milley, 5 Sparrow Drive. Uh, that is a comment that was read into, that's um, Public Works and was read into the record for um, City Council. Lisa Hoover, 1205 Bridgeport. I moved here 24 years ago and we lived temporarily on, the, on IOP while our house was being built. My son settled in as part of the Busy Bee Children's Group at the old rec center. As most of volunteer programs, projects were health related and I had to drag him to them. I used the IOP as our fun volunteer project to give back, tour patrol, building the dune fences, planting sea oats. We have worshiped at Breach Inlet, Sullivan's Island and the Citadel Beach House. Family members have rented beach front houses. I taught my grandchildren that even broke shells are good as they are each unique and have character. Now my husband and I, as we are aging, can no longer park and use the beach to recharge and heal. I work in healthcare and need to decompress from the daily stresses. He was diagnosed during the pandemic with cancer. Please do not take the beach away from us. We usually avoid the beach during tourist season to allow others to use, but these are not normal times. We can, <clears throat> excuse me, pay to park, but can't risk the crowds that you created by the park. 24 hour ban on parking inside streets just doesn't make sense. How much did you spend on the signs that you put up? So many questions, why? Please think of the community and what should be ours as a whole and find a way to share what we should all be allowed to use. And um, Ms. Hoover is not uh, Ms. Joy Duncan Smith of 2804 Hartnett. I'm concerned about the crosswalk on Palms near the Harris Teeter where the two lanes merge into one lane. This area becomes a NASCAR event with people speeding around to merge left. And then you have people on bikes and golf carts trying to cross traffic using the so ill marked crosswalk walk. The new, the area needs to be painted with larger stripes and a big square shape with a standing blinking sign in the middle of it to warn drivers that there's a crosswalk coming up. The whole area is a mess. Stanley, Palm Boulevard, I agree with the paid parking solution for beachgoers. I would extend to 7 p.m. and the lake crowd seems to be the drinkers and also seem to leave the most litter behind darker. So I guess they feel no one sees them. Kevin Canty of Mount Pleasant, the new parking rules are a violation of my right to access the beach. My right to access the beach from Palm Boulevard. You don't own the beach and I live, lived in Mount Pleasant for 56 years and you are abusing your parking enforcement and rule making power. It's outrageous. My family loves the IOP beach and has a right to reasonably park, reasonable parking access without worrying about extreme fines. I am organizing with several friends and our personal attorneys to prepare a class action, civil rights violation and elderly abuse lawsuits as people like my elderly mom are being forced to walk long distances in the heat or stay home. You're being unfair and this will not stand without a vigorous, peaceful legal fight and monetary damages due to people being mistreated like my family and friends expect a significant financial settlement. We will not be bullied by wealthy near beach property owners. When you buy property near a public beach, visitor traffic and parking are part of the package. So don't behave like it is not. If you want to privatize the beach, you just cannot wave your hand, take a greedy vote and do it. Timothy Fabian of Easley. We visited the Coconut Joe bar and restaurant last night at IOP. I don't know where to start, but I will take whatever steps needs needed to get answers. My wife is handicapped, the MS, and this place of business is very unprepared for wheelchair customers. They have a very substandard elevator and no ramps to reach the restaurant. There is a gate to the elevator, an old rickety elevator, and I had to go upstairs to ask how we get her in. The hostess said the lock is not locked to go ahead and use it. 
by the way, the elevator has not been inspected in two years, see picture. While waiting to leave the, on the elevator, one waitress told us the elevator was not operating. I had to go back down to the bottom floor, bring it back up so we could get out. Very frustrated with the situation and the wearing mask was a joke too. <clears throat> Eva Quinley of Knoxville, Tennessee, please do not disallow our uh, chairs and coolers on the beach. It is the one place where we can enjoy and stay apart easily. Chairs and coolers do not transmit the virus. In fact, the chairs help segregate. Michelle Riebling of Mount Pleasant, we need our beach to remain open. It's a safe haven for us. Please do not restrict. Mike Hankins, Mount Pleasant, families are social distancing. There's no need to take family beach time away from the county taxpayers. My family and I visit IOP at least twice a week, and it's our refuge from all that is going on. I have not witnessed any violations or social distancing, except maybe at the county park. Police have a, have a presence and must follow the rules. Please do not limit access. Lawrence Milley, Isle of Palms. I recently had a conversation with the general manager, Chris, from the wastewater plant. Um, I'm not sure this is meant for you guys, but I brought this to his attention about the wastewater plant at the corner of Waterway and 41. Has issues living to it next for the last six years. This was the first time I had complained about the smell. I explained to him that the odor is taking my breath away, making me sick to my stomach and lightheaded. I told him I was concerned for me and my family's health. Hydrogen sulfide can kill. I told him it is so bad it was <coughs> inside my home. The window closed and the AC on. I also complained about the load noises at 5.30 that very morning. It was <coughs> deny everything, saying there's no noise and no smell, besides calling me a liar. I would have expected concern for my health and then offer to look into the cause of the hydrogen sulfide gas. Instead, I got lies and accused of lying. I also have reached out to counsel and got no response or concern for my health or my family's. As a last resort, I have reached out to DHEC for some solution to my problem. I feel very sad that a corporation can get away with this and try to resolve this. I have to outside the island to seek help, very sad indeed. Dina Edwards, Isle of Palms. I don't understand why the city isn't charging for parking at the rec center for beachgoers. Valerie Demshek, Mount Pleasant. Thank you for having an emergency meeting to discuss restrictions on IOP. I'm in full support and more of more restrictions on the beach as well as restaurants here. Given the outbreak of COVID in our state, I am also in support of a complete closure of beaches. The spread of this virus will continue to worsen without further restrictions. Barbara, I'm gonna butcher her last name. She lives on Back Bay Drive. Close our beaches to out-of-state rentals, but allow locals to use our beaches. We have been practicing social distancing, maybe limit the number of cars coming onto IOP. Sullivan's Island prevented people from sitting on the beach with blankets and coolers, which forced more visitors to IOP, which was unfair. And that ends the public comments. You're on mute. Councilmember Buchanan, you're on mute. Perfect, okay. Now we go. <coughs> Moving on. Um, if we could go ahead and I'm gonna try to uh, get a motion to reorder the agenda to bring item, which one is it? 5B, Ryan. B, there it is. Yep. yep, discussion of two change orders. Yep, I'll make that motion, Ryan, to change the agenda. Yeah. I'll second it. Um, anybody have any discussion on that? Basically, so we can get this done and, and out of the way here and get John on his way. So, all those in favor? Take my saying aye. Aye. That's two of us. And okay, Jimmy, we're just we're, just, we're we are reorganizing the agenda move five A up. So, um, Desiree, you want? Yeah, um, so if you don't mind, we can start with the update of the Public Safety Building Rehabilitation Project and then follow through with the change order discussion. Um, John Edward, he's the project manager and uh, for Trident and been, has been overseeing the Public Safety Building Rehabilitation Project. And um, since we have him on the line, I'd, I'd ask him to provide an update on the project, where we are, how we are on budget, and, and um, any any um, information that might be beneficial for the community and for the public safety building on this uh, and, and the public safety committee on this project. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you, Desiree. And um, like I said, my name is John Edward Griffith. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and I'm the project manager for overseeing the Isle of Palms renovation. Um, things are going well out there. Um, I'm sure you've heard. We're coming around the outside on the exterior, finishing up the last wall behind the apparatus bay on the fire station side. Um, all the waterproofing's complete, wrapping up the last of the hardy install. install. We've got the painters are falling right behind them, um, turning the rest of the building blue. And right now, as you can see on the front of the apparatus bay, we've got doing all the prepping for the new apron the fire trucks. Um, so everything's been demoed out and all that will start to go back in this week. Um, the roof panels are continuing. We've got a, a few sections left, um, but that's going all going on fine. Right now on the inside, we're installing the new HVAC system for the third floor fire station. Um, and we're trying to schedule a time between the rainstorms to install the new dedicated outdoor air units up on the roof. Um, so that takes, we got to cut into the roof, install the new structural supports, then install the new unit. All the duct work and everything's been run inside already. Um, and now we're just trying to play the weather game on when we can get two, two decent low percentage days um, to, to do that work. Any questions about where we are or what's going on? Uh, no, not yet. It's, it's coming along good. It, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you guys are trucking along on it. So yes, everybody's anxious to get back in. Great. Well, schedule wise, we're, we're still on track, track in about November timeframe. Um, and then budget wise, we're still looking good on budget. Um, and speaking of which, that's the next two change order items to discuss. Um, first one being a, a flood door. So currently your building has what we call flood logs with panels that get installed outside the doors. And these are, you know, sometimes a cumbersome act you've got to be there somebody's got to do them you got to find them you got to train on them um, and then install them in the event and the way your flood panels are set up your main doors because they swing out are not operable um, so it was brought up by chief graham and some of the others that they do make a door that is flood proof the door itself acts as a floodgate um, and that to have one of those installed in place of one of the flood locks. That way during a storm event, you can install all of them, but then you still have an easy access point in and out of the building to remain operational. Um, you know, as long as you decide to stay in the building, continue to operate. There is some significant costs associated with that. Um, what's on the agenda here, the $30,000. So that is for the double doors, the storefront doors that are your main entry point from the parking lot side. Now we've also looked at another option that's about half that price to do one of the single side doors. So there are some options associated with that. And, you know, Really, it's a it's just a risk assessment on whether that's how how you want to operate the building during a storm event. So, John, when we had this conversation on Thursday, our, our weekly meeting on Thursday, um, both Arnie, the architect, and James Frank, our owner's representative. They both recommended that the city pursue with the double-sided doors, the sort of the more expensive option um, that leads towards the back parking lot. Am I, is that my assessment correct? And can you yes. elaborate a little bit about the reasoning of, you know, rather than doing the side door, which would be single, um, doing the double doors would be beneficial because it's a $50,000 difference. Right. Right, and you're correct, and that was their recommendation. Um, the main reasoning for that is those are your main entry points, you know, with Chief Cornett and Chief Graham, the fire and the police side. That's the community doors. It's right in the middle of the lobby. Um, it's 
you know, the easiest and the quickest uh, for access for employees and whoever else is coming to visit. Uh, these new flood doors look just the same. They act the same. You would never know they're any different. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of the main reasoning for, for choosing those doors. Um, it just seems like the most reasonable location. Um, any of the other doors would have to favor the fire station or the police station side one way or the other. Okay, and then the change order for the seismic bracing on the existing sprinkler system, that's something that the, the sprinkler system should have had in, in uh, as part of the work. Y'all noted that it wasn't, it wasn't done in it originally, so it's something that we have truly no option on, basically. Correct. Correct. So James Frank with Insight, he's your third party inspector and the, the owner's representative. Um, and between him and I, we noticed that when we're doing all the ceiling work, we've got a bunch of the ceilings ripped out, installing new HVAC, that none of the sprinkler pipes have any seismic bracing. on. Um, now, this is a, a normal code that's followed. You got to have side bracing at every end of line restraint and every you know 10 to 12 feet along the the main line um and it's it is what it what exactly it sounds like it's seismic bracing for event. there's a storm or an earthquake that your sprinkler system doesn't fall out of the ceiling um you know we, we recommend that that you need this um all new buildings have this uh, we don't install any of them without now. Not sure how it ended up this way originally, but it's. So because time is of the essence, particularly with this $20,000 change order for seismic bracing for the sprinkler system, um, waiting until the end of the month for council to approve would potentially impact the schedule. So if I have the blessing of this committee, I will go ahead and approve so that they may continue to work uh, in that direction. And then we can get council's blessing um, in ways, you know, at Ways and Means and City Council. I just, I'd hate for us to um, wait on something that we know we have no choice basically on, on pursuing um, and then potentially delaying the, the, the schedule, which is really lo looking really good now. Um, so. That's all we have, Chair. Okay. No, thank you. Um, and and I, the the whole flood panels and flood panel doors. I mean, it, it makes sense because I mean, obviously, it's gonna almost. It's, it really is our emergency operations center, and it's not much of an emergency operations center if you can't get in it. So, um, and I, I'm assuming the rest of the panels will be somewhat similar to what we have at the rec center. Those doors and blocking them up. So. I don't have a problem with that. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Jimmy or Philip? Jimmy? You're on mute. You're on mute. There you go. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in favor of it, but um, uh, just for the record, I don't believe that piece of land flooded during Hugo. <clears throat> oh, right. But, you know, it was just a stroke of luck. So, thank you. No, oh, thank you. <clears throat> so, and there are there are some talks about the flood lines being changed next year as well. Uh, you know, there's one thing Luke and Arnie mentioned, Desiree, last week. Yeah, those have been at work for a while. So, right. yeah. okay. So, if you want, I don't know if you would take this. Um, yeah. Let me pull my agenda up again. We can have a motion to approve um, change orders. Yeah, Ryan, I'll make a motion to approve the two change orders. Second. Eric. Um, so that's change Chair. Go ahead, Desiree. If I may, I also added in the um, to the agenda the contingency funds that we have available as part of the project. Um, as you all know, the contract that we have with with uh, Trident includes some contingency monies. But this was not contemplated, none of these um, two items were con was contemplated in the original 
scope of the project. So this is coming out of our contingency, which okay. currently we have roughly 788,000. We haven't needed to use that for anything um, yet. So, you know, we have, we have enough monies available to cover that expense. Perfect. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Somebody say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you so much, John, for showing up. I appreciate it. Give us some briefing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Got it. Let me move on here. Um, update. Uh, old business A update on update on the rip build, uh, safety. We just did that. Update on breaching like safety camera. Chief, you want anything on this one? So this would be one of those things when COVID first started that we put on on hold for financial purposes as we were waiting to see what type of impact the city would would have from this. Uh, we did get a, a quote for a, an electrician that was not originally built into it. When we first started looking at this, uh, we were priced out on what it would cost to put the camera up. There is an additional $5,000 cost to have the electrical box put in place from the electrician uh, on top of the original $8,000 that was set aside for this camera. And that's, that's kind of where we are now. We haven't ma made any additional progress. We did get the cradle point, but that was prior to COVID starting. Uh, and we did get these quotes, but nothing else had taken place at, at that time. Okay. I mean, um, okay. Do you need, I mean, do you want anything from us or are you still going to move forward or we have to allocate some funds for the additional electrical box or? We originally only set aside $8,000 to put the camera in place. So we would need some type of action to allocate funds so that we could get the electrical box, box put in place. Yeah. And the original camera was also an unbudgeted and approved unbudgeted expenditure. So that's what we're coming back for you uh, to you all because this would be an additional five thousand dollars of unbudgeted um, funds in order for us to proceed. You guys have any comment on that, Jimmy? Philip? Yes. Um, yep. Where would the money come from? <laughs> We haven't identified yet a, a line budget. Um, we can definitely look at what you know what would be available. Um, I'm confident we can probably find five thousand dollars in the in, in um, a line item that we can re, uh, redirect towards this. Um, I'd have to have I'd have to have a little bit more time on it. If it, if it is the will of the committee to approve some funds and bring this before Ways and Means um, on the 18th. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, if we need to wait, we can wait. If you need to try and figure out way, how we can do this, whether it's tourism funds or whether it's um, wherever it's coming from. But um, I, mean, I don't, we don't have to move this forward right now. But if we need more time. I prefer we wait. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, old business. C, discussion of implementing paid parking on the existing public beach parking zones. Um, I'm not sure that we have any update on information on that, Desiree, or you have um... Well, no, we have um, a couple of things. Obviously we brought this before city council last month and we had um, some direction from the whole group on pursuing this, you know, in this direction for implementation in the spring of next year. Um, since then, we've hired, um, we've engaged Stantec because there will be some work needed to be done in, uh, to the actual time plan that needs to reflect the uh, realities on the ground and the signs that are on the ground. So um, we'll be working with Stantec and update, updating that and um, for, this, for the actual sign plan and the ordinance to reflect what the will of council is related to pay parking. Um, I do have some questions though um, from the conversation from council last, last month. Um, our timeline has council approving the final plan by the end of this month in August so that in September we can go ahead and, and council could consider the actual ordinance which needs to be approved by two readings. So my question is one, when it comes to the location where the paid parking would be uh, implemented, we have the existing beach parking zones, including Breach Inlet. The other discussion associated with the area around the rec center included um, 27th and between 27th and 29th on Hartman, including that in the residential district zone. That's 
what I want to confirm? And if so, what happens with 29th Avenue? That was left untreated by the recommendation by from public safety last month and um, no, no guidance or no decision was made by council on that avenue, which means that that would be the only street on um, the island that would be left unregulated in, in, in any way. So I want to talk a little bit about that, you know, direction of how do we treat that in the science plan. Um, and also there was some discussion about uh, providing a seasonal path for non-residents for pay parking. Um, Chief Cornette and I had a meeting scheduled with Flowbird, which would be the mobile app that we currently use at Front Beach, and we would we'd be expanding that to the other areas. And due to the hearing that we had on the parking lawsuit, um, we uh, rescheduled that for this week. So we haven't, we don't have a whole lot of details on um, the capabilities of that app um, when it comes to seasonal passes, but we should by the end of the month. Um, and then during last month's meeting, the question was asked, I think it was Council Member Ward who asked about the potential uh, revenue loss should the city move the enforcement time period on Front Beach from March 1st through to March 5th, uh, 16th, and rather than ending October 31st, ending it at October 15th, and the potential loss using 2019 numbers would be $54,347. So um, you all have that number now, and also the number associated with um, changing the hours at Front Beach. Currently, park pay parking is enforced between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So should, should the city change that from nine to nine to six, uh, consistent with the residential district um, parking, would be uh, roughly a $65,000 revenue loss on um, our parking lots that front. So I just wanted to provide that information to you as you all discuss any potential changes to the recommendations to council. And that's all I have. And Desiree, I talked to you earlier this week about the one of the reasons we're, we're moving forward with this is to improve the infrastructure along Palm Boulevard. Right now, there's I mean, there's so many places that you can't park. Um, there's we don't have bike lanes, we don't have sidewalks on the ocean side, we don't have so we're trying to find ways to improve in, the infrastructure for people to come out and park. In DOT, the, the state's not giving us any money for it, and that's for sure. Um, and I know you were going to try to reach out to Davis and Floyd to try to do some type of uh, rendering of um, what something can be like. And is that something we can look, um, maybe look forward to um, in the next agenda, perhaps, or or the city council? I actually have something. I after our conversation, I I. Um, had a call with Stuart from Santec and he's the, they're the engineers that have been helping us um, for years with when it comes to the managed beach parking plan. And he did a quick drawing, a quick, um, let me see if I can show this to you all. Hold on one second, I'm having <laughs> issues with my computer. <clears throat> of what that would look like. It's not the first time that the city has right. talked about doing something similar. So, um, I don't know. There's, well, there's been definitely been a discussion for having bike lanes um, on Palm Boulevard, both sides. I mean, not only with that, even with our public works, trying to, you know, do trash service in, you know, in the morning and um, not be able to get off the road. Um, a lot of times as well, it ties up traffic, becomes safety issue. I don't know why my computer looks like it just froze. Okay. Can you all hear me or see me? Yeah, yeah. we can. I can hear you. You're frozen on screen. No. Oh. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on, but but I can share that with you all and definitely put it on the. You know, we can discuss it more in more depth next month. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going. What's wrong with my computer? Um, then the other, you know, it's certainly it's something that could be done, um, Chair Buchanan, um, when it comes to making improvements to the to the ocean side of Palm Boulevard. 
that will require a whole lot of work of surveying, identifying utility lines, um, identifying any other type of encroachment or infrastructure um, that we could definitely pursue if that is the will of the committee. That's one thing I'd like to see is, and even if we took a small section of the, and did a test area basically, figure, and then extrapolate that along the whole the entirety of uh, Ocean Boulevard, I mean, of, I say Ocean Side of Palm Boulevard, um, and uh, see what those costs would be. And um, even if we have, it needs to be improved, there's no doubt about it. And even if we have to go out for a revenue bond and have that bond repaid for with the um, parking um, fees, that would help, you know, improve that area. Um, okay. So let's, um, the only thing, so what do you need from us then, Desiree, is just the stipulation on 29th, 27th? I would like a little bit more clarity and maybe a recommendation to council for final consideration, because again, in order for us to meet our deadline of having this implemented by March, we'd have to get, um, you know, we'd have to have some action when it comes to the ordinance. Um, so yes, we need to have a little bit of a guidance related to 29th Avenue, also the dates and hours of enforcement, because we've talked about either maintaining it at 9 to 6, March through October 31st, but um, you know, there's that other consideration about the potential loss of revenue at Front Beach. So um, yeah, we need to talk a, a little bit about that if, if it's okay with the committee. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what we're here for. So Jimmy, Philip, do you have anything to talk yeah. about? Go ahead. Jimmy. Um, I was wondering if Desiree, if you would give us those numbers again. One was 50 some thousand and the other one was 60. Identify those for us, please. Desiree is frozen again. I think we lost her. I think, I think the 50, 50 some thousand was Front Beach uh, reducing the, the period to the end of March. I mean, right. the first of March and the end of October. I think it's a, that's a pretty substantial amount of cash. Does anybody remember what she said? About, I think it was 65, and where was that? 65K if you changed it from eight to eight to nine to six. Yes. Yeah, I, I just think that's too much revenue to lose. Agree. Yeah, Desiree, originally, or one of the proposals was March 1st to October 31st, nine to six, right? Correct, and that was for the for the beach parking uh, down at Palm and the other beach parking areas. Um, I think that the idea was to try to make consistent the hours that we enforce parking on Front Beach and the hours that we enforce part that we would be enforcing safe parking on the other areas. But there will be, you know, there is, you know, there's a risk, not necessarily a risk, but there's a there's going to be a change in revenue potentially. Um, if we do that, and, and I'm not sure if if it's, you know, if maybe we can talk about what are some of the un unintended consequences of just having two different enforcement times and hours, you know, Front Beach could be nine to six, and, um, for, you know, I'm sorry, the paid parking on Palm could be nine to six, and Front Beach could stay being eight to eight. Um, the residential district could also change. That would only mean having to change the those existing signs because the residential district only parking has the date, the times embedded in it. So we'd have to change the whole sign. But that's another alternative if that's the will of, of council. The reason why pay parking on Palm and the other beach areas makes sense for that to be consistent with the times and, and hours that the residential district is enforced is because people are likely not going to pay to park on Palm if they can park um, you know, one of the avenues or one of the residential districts for, uh, at no cost after a certain hour. So that's sort of our logic for proposing that. Um, but you know, we, we could, we could go either way. Okay. Um, what do you think, Philip? You yeah, I don't, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess maybe this is for chief Cornette. Um, I mean, having two different time zones. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of like to leave Front Beach alone personally and just leave it as it is. Kind of to Jimmy's point, that revenue, that's that's a decent amount of revenue for us. Um, I mean, Chief, does it create issues or complexities to have two different time zones and applications? I think best practice, not only for our staff, but for people who are visiting our island, 
uh, it is much easier if there is one set time that way they're not trying to remember I park on front beach I got to be there at this time or, yeah. or I got to pay if I go here I can pay here it, it's easier for people visiting and for enforcement purposes if, if the time is the same across the board yeah that's very fair that's a good point so if that if Desiree if that's the case to me I would I would rather change the residential and and get and get the consistency that way that's just my opinion okay. I will say to that um, just because I remember the conversations back when um, when the city first implemented the beach managed parking plan it was mostly the residents who really pushed for the 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, restriction just because if they have people over if they have any gatherings or um, you know friends over at, you know in the evenings and they would have to either you know they would have to give them a pass if not their their visitors would would potentially get a parking ticket um i guess we you know back then we only gave people one booklet now we provide um, residents two free booklets and there is no limit to the number of times they could use, use each pass so that that may solve that concern but i just wanted to mention that um that that may be something that some community members would um, not be happy about particularly, but or, we can, you know. Right. Or we can leave it as is and have the community, have the residential district one one time zone and the commercial district another time zone. And I mean, like you said, it, that could be a problem, I mean, problem solver there. Just, I, mean, I, think, I think people are used to it by now, it's been in effect for probably at least three years. Oh. Uh, do you, you have to have some guidance from us today, Desiree? I think so, yeah. Yes, ideally. And anything that comes out of the committee will be presented to council, so we'll have another opportunity to discuss with the full body. Um, but we need to, yeah, we need to start wrapping this up <laughs> by, by August so we can get the ordinance drafted for September. And I then I mean I would say just as for now we'll, we'll leave it as is. I mean that's the way everybody's trained right now. Um, it'll save us money and have a change outside. Oh, I agree money. with that. Uh, and um, yeah, but as for as as for the um, parking around the rec center, you need some guidance on that as well. 27th, 28th, 29th. The issue that arises with that is we have so many events that go on there that will bring folks onto the island. So to make it residential only, obviously will be a problem. Um, I, I, I just don't, I, I like the idea of just making it recreation use. It, it just makes, I mean, it makes sense. So because I'd hate to have people show up to play a baseball game or play basketball and have, you know, couldn't, couldn't park. Yeah, couldn't park. So we'll just it's, extend that area around. Okay. Those are city owned roads too, so they're not state owned roads. One question, if I may, and this is just because I was coming in and out, so I may have missed part of the conversation. But when we talk about the timeline and hours of enforcement, keeping them as is, what, does that mean that from beach stays eight to eight and the paid parking on the new beach parking areas would be nine to six? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Right now. <laughs> okay, and then 29th Avenue would be um, signed as recreation department use or recreational department or center use only for 29th. Whether you're using the dog park or mm -hmm. playground or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I guess the other discussion was around the seasonal path, but we don't have a whole lot of details yet on the app's capability to do uh, for doing that. Yeah, I, I thought we had decided not to do that on the paid parking on Palm. Did I misremember? Well, I, I think, Philip, it was because we we're trying to find a way. It would have been logistically, it would have been hard to hand out passes. From yeah. the, but if somebody could buy one online, Got it. I have to go into City Hall or have to go into get an actual sticker then. Um, yeah. They're just looking into it. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, and, and again, Council Member Pounds, at City Council, we are, um, I think it was Council Member Smith who asked us to look into that, you know, ability, you know, whether it's feasible or not. Um, so we'll just, we're just doing some research um, on that. Then I did, I also want to mention that we, in the past several weeks, we have been receiving, Chief and I have been receiving emails from residents concerned about um, people reproducing residential passes and putting them in their in their vehicles and also reproducing the daily visitor passes. And I just want to make sure that people are reminded that the daily visitor passes are meant to be used for when there is not enough parking around, you know, in their property. And it's supposed to be used by uh, people who are visiting that property and they need to be parked around along the right of way adjacent to the house where the visitor post of pass was issued to. So we'll be doing a little bit of um, you know added social media and education to the public. Um, and the officers have been advised to do take a look closer look at these passes and ensure that they're being used appropriately. And any person who has an illegal pass or a you know legally reproduced pass could could receive a hundred dollar citation. So, uh, Chief, I don't know if you want to talk or um, add anything to what I just said related to these complaints that we've been getting recently. The only, I mean, we've had several complaints that people were misusing them. Uh, ordinance also gives us the ability to, in the police department, to revoke those parking passes if we find somebody misusing those. Uh, so, those are some things that we're educating our folks on. So far, we've not had to do any of those. Uh, but there was some chatter that people were reproducing some uh, fraudulent parking passes and, and we're looking into that. And if we see any of that, they, they're in the system. So if somebody's got one that they're not supposed to have then they can be issued a ticket. And the other thing that we'll be talking with Flowbird and um, hoping that we could use with our license plate reader uh, software that we have in the budget, it would be uh, purchasing for pay parking is in some way um, adding the residential, the issuance of the residential decals to see if we can tie that to the vehicle so that the LPR could also recognize that vehicle as having been issued a valid residential parking decal. Not sure how we, I don't think there's a whole lot we can do with the visitor daily, uh, daily visitor passes, but we'll also have a discussion about how can we mitigate some of the issues that we know are happening particularly now when parking has been restricted, um, I'll be temporarily, but even when we go to pay parking, we may see people getting, trying to get creative to get away from um, having to pay to park. So we are aware and we're definitely having those conversations about what's, what's possible for us to do to, to address that without adding a whole lot of work to really to our officers who are on foot. You know, we definitely don't want them to have to spend 10 minutes with each vehicle um, going through um, different, you know, uh, databases to try to identify whether it's legal or not. So if it's feasible, then we'll definitely uh, pursue it. Thank you. Um, there we go. And then what was the other thing we had here? Um, anything else on that topic? Okay, moving on to old business D update and discussion of limiting parking on the land side of Palm Boulevard between 22nd and 40th. Um, go. The only thing I wanted to add to that is that, you know, this was part of an emergency ordinance where we were instructed to look into implementing that as soon as possible. Um, last month, I reported to you all that we had a meeting with Stantec and to identify um, whether or not eliminating the land side of Palm Boulevard um, changes the city's definition or of public access parking. And we talked about how the city provides um, at least three and four times as much parking as it's required by the Beachfront Management Act, even if we eliminate the land side of parking. And I believe that the, re you know, the, the reason really for eliminating the land side of, of parking on Palm was to address public safety concerns of uh, uh, the emergency vehicle, vehicles not being able to go through Palm Boulevard in the event of an emergency when we have vehicle uh, cars parked on both sides of the road. 
Um, so what we're going to do is, because this, this was a directive mainly from full council, what, when Stantec does their revisions to the sign plan as part of the paid parking, we'll just go ahead and include the, the changes to um, lane side parking. Um, what I will say is, I, you know, if it's a no parking, if it's a no parking area, just like we have some areas on ocean, um, then it's no parking, you know, and, and that applies to everybody. Um, so just want to make sure that folks are aware of that, um, that even residents won't have the capability of parking on the land side, land side of Palm Boulevard, if that's, if it's a no parking. And, and Desiree, one of the things we mentioned the last meeting when some of this was discussed was the idea of increasing that four foot setback a little bit to maybe six six feet and, and honestly and i'm not sure how we do it i meant i meant the for some reason they put the palm trees down palm boulevard and they put them at a at a spot where <laughs> i mean it, it, it almost impedes parking or actually controls parking so <laughs> if we could go through you know and if if cars could park up to that far and i don't know i don't know how far that is but if we could have stantec look at that as well to try and get cars as far off to the road up to the palm trees um I think that'll help a bunch. I'm not sure if six feet is it or what, but it definitely needs to be more. Um, so are you referring to the ocean side of Palm? I'm referring to both sides. Yeah. Both sides? Okay. I think it'll be, if, if council moves forward with not eliminating parking on the land side of Palm, I think it's doable on that spot, Chief, but I, if, and maybe cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it'll be harder on the ocean side of Palm Boulevard to establish a six you know, Here's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm, as for right, if, if, if it's a limit, if parking is eliminated on the landward side, it, then it's gonna be, then it's a non-issue. <laughs> Is what I'm thinking, but if it continues, or if it, even moving forward, it's still trying to get cars further off the road is what I'm trying to do. Okay, understood. Um, new business: a discussion of improvements of the ocean side of Palm 41st. That, that we kind of discussed that a little bit already. Um, the just the ocean side, trying to figure out what we can do with that and try to improve the parking along those areas right now. Anybody else have any more to add to that? Um, she touched on C, discussion of, and consideration of purchase of Beach Patrol, v, the ATVs. You want to touch on that, Desiree? Well, I wanted, I, I was able to pull up the drawing that Stantec produced for us related to the improvements to the ocean side of Palm Boulevard. If you want me to pull it up, Yeah, that's fine. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So this is what uh, uh, Chair Buchanan was talking about, you know, for the city to um, look into installing a bike lane on Palm Boulevard on the ocean side of Palm and having the parallel parking space then some green space that would act as a buffer between the sidewalk and the vehicle. And then this would be a uh, pedestrian path type sidewalk. Uh, we have enough right of way currently there um, on Palm Boulevard that would be, that would accommodate that. However, there is, there are obviously some utilities, some palm trees, um, encroachments from, you know, property owners that have been there for a long time. So I mean, it's, it's definitely doable and um, possible. We just have to do some, um, like I was saying earlier, some surveying work and some engineering work to, uh, to truly identify um, the specifics of um, installing some sort of, you know, uh, combination of bike lane plus pedestrian um, path. But this is what, you know, this is just a rough conceptual drawing of what that could look like um, in the future. 
Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Desiree. And we'll uh, and I'll bring this rip float this in front of um, council at our, at our you know report and during city council and see what how everybody feels about it and whether how much further we'll go forward with it. Um. Yeah. Oh no, beach vehicles, the ATVs now. Discussion. I could jump in here. This would be the uh, replacement for the Bobcat. And mm -hmm. what I realized when I got here is that we had a Bobcat that was used to help fill in holes on the beach. Uh, that Bobcat was due to be replaced this budget year as it was, but that was a single purpose vehicle that could only be used for that purpose. My thought was to budget for an ATV that has a plow attachable to the front. That gives it a dual purpose. So it can be used to patrol the beach as well as when you come across these holes, you can attach the uh, plow to the front, fill the holes back in. And it looks like we should be able to come in uh, just a little under budget as well when we go ahead and make that purchase. We do have three quotes. They should be included in your packet. Okay. For those. Perfect. Not a problem. Um, Brian, I'll make a motion to approve that if you need it. Yes. So we can move it forward to Ways and Means. Um, a yeah. second. I'll second it. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. That was all of us. You did. Do you want to unmute Jimmy, I think? I don't yeah. know if you. Blink. Aye. Aye. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. aye. Moving on again, um, Chief, uh, discussion of pedestrian crosswalks and intersection, uh, intersection safety. And you know, obviously you heard, heard one of the uh, letters today, you know, talking about the intersection that I keep bringing up or the area that I keep bringing up in front of like, 20th Avenue there and the, the need for increased signage and increased, you know, visualization of th that crosswalk. And, um, and, you know, just traveling around the state and seeing all these different communities that have the things that we want, or the, some of these ideas, the blinking crosswalks, the, the lighted crosswalks, that is like, um, I'm not sure why we can't move forward and do something like that. So for us, the, anytime we're putting signage or anything like that up, it just has to be approved by SCDOT mm -hmm. uh, to include the flashing lights. And um, anything that we put there has to, oh, I don't know what just happened. Screen share. Okay. Um, anything that we do at that intersection for the crosswalks uh, for signage or lights or flashing has to be approved by SCDOT. We can certainly move and see. The, again, the worst they could do is tell us no. And in the meantime, my goal is to do our best when we're able to do so to get an officer there in that, that area to slow traffic down. It, it, it is a, it's not necessarily that they're always speeding there where it is you're coming off of a 25 to a 35 mile hour area. And so people will pick up speed coming around that corner. They're really just accelerating to the speed limit. Some do speed and they do get uh, invitations to come hang out with us on a court morning. But you know, we can certainly step up our enforcement in that area. I think that's something we should be doing anyways on all of our crosswalks. Uh, okay. But we'll move forward. I'll get uh, our new Lieutenant to reach out and, and see what we can do with DOT. Okay, I appreciate it. Anybody else, Philip? And Ryan, your comment was specific to the twentieth crosswalk, and I, I, I know we keep, I mean, we keep talking about the connector as well. So I don't know, Chief, if that's kind of all in one. You know, whatever kind of signage we can do, we get it done at both places. Or sorry, Desiree, I think I interrupted you. Yeah, all the crosswalks, literally. Yeah. I'm, I just, that letter was addressing that the area in front of Palm. I'm on um, that twentieth today, so. But yeah, I appreciate that, Chief. If, if Forsyth can jump on that, that'd be great. And um, also, um, Chair Buchanan, we talked about, which is why we included those drawings, those pictures in the package. Um, when it comes to those lines, the stop lines on the avenues heading towards Palm, there are significant inconsistencies there. There are some avenues that have the stop line. There are others that have it past the sidewalk, which is, um, not the right way it should be before you know the, the vehicle needs to stop before the sidewalk 
So we'll be we'll be um, sending a letter to SADOC to have them come in and correct that over over here. It's um, certainly confusing. Perfect. No, thank you for doing that. You know, we talked about that last week, and yeah, it's different where you pull up to. So, um, that. Um, oh, I did have somebody, and I, I had on the agenda for uh, speed limits on side streets, and um, and I think one of the biggest concerns we got that is when you have an, you know, everybody's out at the beach, you have an afternoon thunderstorm pop up, and people are trying to find the quickest way to get off the island and zipping up and down the side streets. Um, while just lowering the speed limit doesn't, you know, change anything. I mean, it's obviously it's enforcement and it's hard to enforce all those side streets at the same time. But Chief, the the, the question that I got from a lot of folks is actual, the, the, an unmarked street is 30 miles an hour, correct? That's accurate. That's per South Carolina statute 56 5 15 20. It's 30 miles an hour if they do not have a sign up in a residential area. Right. And what would what would it take to lower the side streets to 25? So that would take another conversation with SCDOT. Uh, and in the past, I've been able to successfully work with DOT on, on main roads to get speed limits reduced. I've not done that necessarily in a residential area so i don't know if, if the criteria is different in that area than what they would normally look at uh, but we could certainly have that conversation I mean, the worst i could do is tell us that we can't change anything right and they and they really don't have a problem saying that most times so but yeah if you could reach out that'd be great and um uh, is there a de is there a, a goal of what we would be looking for as far as speed limit? Uh, as I don't even know if we have the leeway to say it. They may tell us, but right. just. Yeah, that, that's what I would, I, would, I, would, I would inquire. I mean, whether it's, you know, 25 or so. Well, it's 25 in Wild Dunes, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a couple of them, just 15 in some places, 20 in some places, 25 in some places. It's kind of all over the place. Found Matter drives 25. <laughs> but Wild Dunes is set by the Wild Dunes Association. Right, right. Yep. right. Yeah. Yep. They can kind and of change. Hey, hey, Chief, I know sometimes you go in, kind of, Ryan, to your comment, when you travel around the state or the country, you see, you come into a city and it says, you know, all roads are 20 or pick a number unless otherwise noted. I mean, I wonder how folks get away with that. And maybe these are different states. Maybe it's not South Carolina that I'm thinking about, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, just saying it's, you know, that way you wouldn't have to have signage everywhere. You can just have one big sign as people come into the city that says, you know, all roads are X unless otherwise posted. I can look into it and find out. Yeah. <laughs> and it could have been a dream I had, Chief. I don't know. I may have never seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've seen it. Yeah, I have too, Jimmy. And I think, I mean, it just seems like an easy way to cut out signage all over the place. Because right now there's nothing... I mean, if you, I mean, I ride my bike all over the place on Hartnett and, you know, some of the side roads, there's no postings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right. And I'd hate to move, I'd hate to have it where we, now we, every time you turn a corner, you have a 25 mile an hour speed limit sign. Agree. I don't, the sign. Right, we got enough signs. Yeah. That's why I like the one posted right at Yeah. Here. I like that too. Possibility. So, okay. Um, Sorry, you're good. Moving forward, oh, I put this uh, discussion of the Front Beach Loading Zone parking area. Um, I don't, you guys are aware there's a loading zone kind of in front of one of the hotels, in front of the restaurants, and basically during the day they're used for loading. I mean, commercial activity, people coming in, coming out, and I've had some of the businesses inquire whether or not we can make that um, that loading zone after hours parking. And um, I didn't see there being a big issue with that, but. Chief, would you see any problem with, with that? I mean, would you have to sign it and just say, you know, pay parking after eight? I, I believe that we own those, if I had that conversation correctly with Mr. Fergoso. Yeah. Um, if we own them, you certainly can do that. What, what I've seen in the other areas, other cities that do that, you would mark them as normal parking spots. So you would have to redo your lines. And then you just have a sign that says, during these hours, this is a loading zone only, uh, with, which is very similar to what you're talking about, just a little little different. Okay. 
Um, Philip, Jimmy, do you have anything on that? I mean, I, I, anything we can do to kind of help out our front Yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea, Ryan. Um, Chief, can I put that on your plate? We could certainly work on it for you. Um, we just need to understand what what hours we would be looking, and I don't know if we would need to change the ordinance um, for parking up there. That would be a question That's, maybe. I think the first thing we probably need to do is probably reach out to some of those businesses and ask them what their loading times are, what times they're having deliveries, and we can just work around that. And, um, and then we'd also need to get some pricing on restriping that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, moving on. Department reports. Hat. Hey, good morning. <laughs> Sorry for my uh, tardiness this morning. Couldn't have been helped. So, uh, you guys already got the monthly report sent to you, is that correct? From the fire department? Yes. Good. So, what I won't do is, is read it line by line and bore you silly. I will tell you that um, we are about 20 calls less than we were last year, um, but that could be for many varying things. Just uh, 20 jellyfish in one day could have made that difference. <laughs> so um, the two things that didn't get put on this report that I would like to note, one is that we did hire two new individuals who I feel like are gonna be a great addition to the uh, to our family here at the City of Olive Palms. Uh, they're doing very well as of so far. The other is, is on the 31st of July, we did do a tabletop emergency operations uh, exercise, which went really, really well. And I think that um, we should see uh, exponential growth from there um, going forward. So other than that, if there's not any questions, you guys have all the numbers and narratives in front of you. Oh, we're good. Anybody? Perfect. Chief? I'll run through hours real quick. July, we had 1,680 calls for service, uh, 1,201 parking tickets, 115 incident reports, and 145 charges made. Those are the, the big numbers that kind of pop out. Uh, things that we've done, we did fill a, what was a captain position. We filled it with a lieutenant, which is a lower rank, but it gives a clear chain of command from a chief captain lieutenant. And that is Lieutenant Forsyth. And then we promoted one to detective, which is Chris Sanders. And that is <coughs> so those promotions are effective tomorrow. The other thing I brought up last month was dispatch. We still had a couple issues with dispatch where they weren't answering the radio when calls were being given out or calls were forwarded to them. Uh, one of those specifically led to an officer doing a traffic stop and then <coughs> down while they were doing their traffic stop. However, I will say, Dispatch has reached out with some new program that they're doing with maybe some ways that we can work together a little bit better to improve on those things. The only other thing I'd bring up I'd like us to maybe consider would be the alarm ordinance. Right now, we have an ordinance for alarms that if you don't permit your alarm, you can get a ticket and they have to be monitored alarms. The reason I bring it up is because we're, I think that can cause people to not get an alarm because they don't want to get a penalty. The average burglary takes about five minutes for somebody to get in and get out. If there's no alarm, they have a lot longer to do that. And if there's an alarm, then our response time is much faster than five minutes. So we have a greater likelihood of catching them in the act. And I, I just wanna make sure that we're doing all we can to encourage alarms. The other part of that is most people are now using ring doorbell, the nest, blink, a lot of these different monitoring systems that they're monitoring themselves. So this ordinance doesn't even apply to those individuals because it's not a, a monitored alarm system as it was originally put in the ordinance. Just something I'd like us to discuss, maybe changing how we do that and doing away with the permit uh, of those alarms. And that's all I have, unless you have any questions for me. Anybody, Philip, Jimmy? <clears throat> I guess the only question I got, what have <clears throat> we started to see more um, coyote activity? And I was gonna roll this into here, but I, what, have, what, what have you noticed or your team noticed with, with regards to coyotes or coyote calls or? So last month we had two sightings. This month we have, or in July, we've had zero uh, sightings that were reported to the police department. I hear some people talking about them, but not much information. Uh, one thing that was taken out of the budget was the money that was spent on trapping those coyotes and putting those traps out. 
so we're really just kind of monitoring them right now as they come in our animal control officer will take that information they're still tracking in the system working with the coyote coalition to make sure that we're keeping all that data updated but that's in july we had none reported to us not saying there weren't any but none were reported to us okay <clears throat> that's and i guess that's it i mean that's the best way of people making sure they call in when they see them okay we we'll stay on top of it um miscellaneous business none next meeting date is september 7th already hey ryan that's uh labor day just fyi is it yeah yep yep we can do it the following week if we want. Desiree, is that fine? Absolutely. I didn't realize that I had us all working that day. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, lady. <laughs> all right. So we'll just um, edit it and um, we'll have it on the 14th. Okay. Sounds good. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good one, everyone. Thanks, folks. Bye.